Hello, I'm not Chuck. In this video I plan to talk about lead acid battery specifications, where to get the specs, how to understand them, and how to decide which ones are most important to you as a van or RV owner. That's the main purpose of this entire video series, to provide basic information about lead acid batteries, how to choose them, how to install them, and how to maintain them. Understanding battery specs is like many other topics, confusing at first but perfectly understandable with a little background information. I highly recommend that you watch the first two videos in this series, and even if you have seen them, a second look might make this video more meaningful to you. I have put a link to them at the top right corner of the screen. You should remember this information from the first video in the series. The top table lists the three general uses for lead acid batteries and suggests which of the three might be suitable for use as a house battery in a van or RV. The bottom table lists the three primary technologies used to build lead acid batteries and identifies which of them are prevented from spilling. Both tables now have a column added to identify the relative cost associated with each choice. Taken collectively, there are nine possible combinations of the choices. However, I want to reduce that number from nine to three. As you see, starting batteries aren't really suitable for use as house batteries, and while certain dual-purpose batteries might be used, I'm going to recommend against them, because of the extra care that is required to keep from ruining them very quickly. So that leaves true deep-cycle batteries as the only remaining choice in the top table, and reduces our choices to one of three technologies listed in the bottom table. You won't really be equipped with all the technical information you need to choose until after the next video or two in the series. Okay, where is this technical information going to come from, you might ask? I have made the question a multiple choice. That always helped me on tests. Now what do you say? Well, here's what I think. Okay, if the answer is none of the above, what is the best source? Let's go straight to the horse's mouth, the really smart people who design and build the batteries. They certainly should know, and fortunately most of them provide the data in a format that we mere mortals can understand. It's called a data sheet, or sometimes a spec sheet. Technical data sheets are intended to provide all the information required for buyers to make good decisions based on their needs. Notice that I said intended to provide. That's because not all data sheets are created equal. Some are better than others. And some of the better ones that I have found are from Trojan Battery Company. They're not perfect, in my opinion, but they're good enough that I will use this one as a guide to help explain how to understand lead-acid battery specifications. I won't cover everything in the data sheet at this time, but I will tackle the most timely parts. I'll discuss one section of the sheet at a time and put that section on the screen as I talk about it, but I suggest that you download your personal copy from the web at the address shown above. As you see, this particular data sheet is composed of two pages and contains quite a lot of information in the form of tables, photos, drawings, and graphs. At first glance, it may seem overwhelming, but you can handle it in the same way you would eat an elephant, one bite at a time. Here's the top section of the front page. Starting at the top left, just under the Trojan logo, there is the model number of the battery, 30XHS, and the words pod vent. Apparently, Trojan has chosen to call the cells, or maybe the cell covers, there are two of them, pods. Notice that each cover has a small hole at the top center of the front edge. Those are the pod vents. They are there to allow gases to escape from inside the battery and are your tip-off that the 30XHS is not a sealed battery. So if you turn the battery over, the electrolyte will spill out. I hope you remember that the electrolyte is a sulfuric acid solution, so letting it get outside the battery is a very bad idea. It will burn your skin, your clothes, and most everything else it touches. Don't do it. The next few lines tell you that the battery is a 12-volt model, the case is made of polypropylene, that it is a deep-cycle flooded lead-acid battery, and it's maroon in color. 
The line labeled dimensions tells you nothing and should be left off the sheet. The line labeled watering refers to the fact that some batteries are constructed so that water can be added to them by a system of tubes connected to each cell. The 30XHS does not have this feature available. The first column in the table refers to the battery's size and shape. There are some standardized dimensions for batteries that were defined by the Battery Council International, abbreviated BCI. Some of the most common sizes are called Group 24, Group 27, Group 31, and so forth. The 30XHS battery conforms to the dimensions for a Group 30H. The second column from the left is labeled as Type, but it really should be labeled as Model because the 30XHS is a Trojan model number and means nothing else. The third column is a repeat of the 30XHS voltage, which is 12 volts. Column 4 tells you that there are six individual cells inside the 30XHS case. That's standard for a 12-volt lead-acid battery. Column 5 refers to the terminal type that is used on the 30XHS, but there are actually three different types that might be equipped. Notice the tiny G next to the word type in the column heading. That refers to another section on the back page. So, as you see, the 30XHS can be manufactured with up to three different types of terminals or connectors. Each has a type number, 7, 8, or 9, and a corresponding name and abbreviation. The WNT, or wingnut terminal, is the best for use as a house battery in a van or RV. Columns 6, 7, and 8 provide the case dimensions and correspond to a drawing on the rear side of the data sheet. Notice that the dimensions are provided in inches with millimeters inside the parentheses. From left to right, there are three views, a front view, a top view, and an end view. The battery's weight in pounds and kilograms is provided in column 9. Yep, they're heavy, especially when you start carrying three or four in a van. Now let's move from physical specifications to electrical. The first two columns on the left are labeled cranking performance and are left blank because the 30XHS is not intended to be used as an engine starting battery. Now, that's not to say that it couldn't be used as a starting battery, it just means that it's not designed for that purpose. The next two columns are labeled capacity minutes and are subdivided into two sets of numbers. Notice that there is a reference letter A which refers to a note on the back page. This is a really important note for two reasons. First, it explains what the table entries mean. If the battery is connected to a load that draws a steady 25 amperes of current, it will be completely discharged in 225 minutes. But if the current draw is increased to 75 amperes, the battery will only last 57 minutes. I will wait a few seconds while you read the explanation on the screen. In the simplest terms I can think of, this means that the greater the load you put on a battery, the faster its discharge rate will increase. Notice that I said its discharge rate will increase faster than the load increases. That's a really important fact to understand and to remember. The note also explains that the numbers in the column are the minutes that a 30XHS battery will continue to supply power before being discharged to 1.75 volts per cell, which is the level at which a cell is considered completely discharged. Yes, a lead-acid battery cell is considered completely discharged when it drops to 1.75 volts. And that's not just me or the Trojan Battery Company that says that. It's an internationally mandated standard that all reputable battery manufacturers accept. Anyone who tells you that a lead-acid battery should be used all the way down to zero volts is just plain wrong. And here's why that is so important. 
You should remember that a 12-volt lead-acid battery has six cells connected in series, so multiplying 1.75 volts times six gives the voltage at which the battery is completely discharged. That's not just this particular Trojan battery, that's for all 12-volt lead-acid batteries. This is a fact that most people absolutely don't know. They mistakenly think that any voltage above zero means that the battery still has some usable power in it, and that's completely wrong. Please hang on to that fact because it will come up again and again as you learn more about lead-acid batteries. The next four columns are also really important. A battery's amp-hour rating is usually the first number, after the voltage, that van dwellers and RVers hear about, and they make many buying decisions on that number alone. Note that there is an explanatory note B related to these columns. Note B is very similar to note A, and the calculations are similar. Notice that in this data sheet there are actually four different amp hour ratings, each based on a different number of hours, 5, 10, 20, or 100. Also notice that the shorter the number of hours, the lower the amp hour rating. That's another way to look at the same fact I talked about a few minutes ago. And that is that the faster a battery is drained, the faster its rate of drain increases. For example, let's look at the 5-hour rating. It's 105 amp hours. But if you increase the drain time from 5 hours to 20 hours, that is, drain the battery more slowly, the amp hour rating jumps to 130. And a 130 amp hour rating over 20 hours means that the battery is being drained at 6.5 amperes per hour. But what does that really mean in practical terms? 6.5 amperes from a 12 volt battery is a power drain of 78 watts. And to give you a frame of reference, think about a 75 watt incandescent light bulb. Running one continuously for 20 hours would take all the power the battery has to offer before it is completely drained to 10.5 volts. That doesn't sound like much power, does it? Well, it's really even less, and I'll get back to that later. The column labeled energy KWH could also be labeled power KWH because it deals with watts. More specifically, it deals with kilowatts. Notice that it also is based on a 100 hour discharge time. Here's a formula that I hope you remember from an earlier video. If you multiply 12 volts, the battery voltage, times the ampere hour rating, 144, you will get the watt hour rating, 1728. And because kilo means 1,000, you can divide 1,728 watt-hours by 1,000 to get the number of kilowatt-hours, 1.73. It's just another way to look at the same battery capacity. One way it's expressed as amp-hours, and the second way as kilowatt-hours. The last two columns are blank, and I'm pretty glad, aren't you? No explanation is required. We will finish this data sheet in the next video, as well as look at the best parts from some other manufacturers. I don't know about you, but my brain is tired. Next time I will finish discussing lead-acid battery data sheets. Until then, try to assimilate what you have just seen and heard. Thanks for watching. Please comment, give me a thumbs up, share this video, and most of all, please subscribe. Remember, I'm not Chuck.